Hey there, Father Crabbers, Ben here from Cinderblock Studios, and a few years ago I made a video called Making Paint Out of Chalk Pastels, and while that video was really fun, it was also very experimental, so this time, we're doing it right. Stick around. So rather than completely doing a remake of that original video, because honestly, there wasn't anything wrong with it, per se, uh, it's just about that I've learned some things since then, so I'm going to call this part two of making paint out of chalk pastels. Now, something that I lacked in that initial video was something known as a paint muller. One of these things. A big, giant, well, depends on the size you get, glass, uh, grinder, and a mixing plate specifically designed for grinding pigment to make paint with, at least in small batches. Now, if you don't understand really how paint is made and tubed, uh, Normally, so whether it's be uh, a, an oil, an acrylic, a watercolor, what have you, uh, in big manufacturing plants, what happens is they mix the paint and pigment, kind of like in a giant uh, mixer, like a kitchen mixer or cement, not cement mixer, what you might see, see in a bakery. Then they just they put that stuff onto what is known as a paint mill. Uh, or dispersion mill, and then you get big giant uh, steel drums that push against each other at different speeds and for different amounts of time in order to spit out what is essentially gets put into a tube. Uh, now prior to that whole process and prior to paint being made and manufactured in that way, what artists did is they ground their own paint using a tool very similar to this. Uh, so essentially it's pigment, uh, your binder, so uh, like a linseed, a alkyd, or a walnut oil if you're making an oil paint, uh, some sort of an acrylic uh, medium or gel if you're making acrylic, or gum arabic or, or another water soluble medium if you're making watercolors. And it was just that down to the artist grinding down that pigment itself, <coughs> mixing that paint together, setting it aside until you had all those colors. And that's what we're going to be doing here today, now that I finally have the tools to do so. Now a couple notes before we get started. Uh, one, I didn't do this initially for that video. One, because I didn't have these tools. And two, because these tools are expensive. Uh, I actually treated myself recently because my birthday's coming up and I was like, you know what, I've got a little extra money to burn right now, so let me go out of my way, find the cheapest one I can, and honestly the cheapest one I can is still fairly pricey. But really what you want to get is, again, a uh, big uh, muller as well as the mixing plate. The mixing plate is actually very important because this is a thick glass. Uh, first I was thinking, well, let's just put it on my glass palette. No, this is a thin piece of glass and that will break. Uh, you could probably do this uh, mixing on like a, a piece of tile or, or uh, thick slate or something like that if you happen to have a big chunk of something laying around. But I didn't, well, at least and I didn't go out of my way for that, but uh, having the two tools together mean actually a lot more than you might realize. And you'll see that as we go forward. The second thing to note here is, we're still talking about cost, this is to make paint out of chalk pastels, well, yes it works, we established that in part one. Uh, it's expensive to do uh, if you're using high-end pastels. So I'm not saying go out and get yourself like a, like a Rembrandt or a Blick pastel or other comparable pastels. There are ones that actually range, you know, two, three, four, five, six dollars per pastel. That's going to be a waste of money if you're doing it that way. You could actually buy little jars and, and, and bot, like bottle jars, whatever. They're in containers like that big of, uh, of pigments. And that's a much more effective way to do that. Uh, additionally, with that concept of buying pigments, if you're going to be doing anything other than basic colors and earth pigments, uh, so earth pigments and basic colors being like a white or a black, anything that's uh, heavy metal, you're going to need a respirator. Uh, so face mask and, and one of those canisters uh, to breathe because if you're grinding that pigment down and breathing that in, that's very, very hazardous to do. Me, on the other hand, I'm using uh, cheap low-end chalk pastels. I went with a uh, couple of reds and a yellow for this one. Uh, because I know the pigments aren't going to be a bother uh, to me health-wise, and I will not re need that respirator. But again, if you're using so like like lead whites, uh, flake like flake whites traditionally with oils, uh, cadmiums, cobalts, uh, manganese, any any of those traditional heavy metal pigments, you're going to need a respirator. So 
just letting you know going forward. Now all that said, let's go ahead and get started. So, as I just mentioned, we're going to be making some sort of a reddish orangish kind of color today with these three sort of half stick pastels I have sitting here. Now, as you can see, I've actually used these pastels in the past and for different reasons. Actually, this one I want to wipe off because it's got a lot of other pigment on it that I don't want to taint this mix with. Uh, but I wanted to just, I was looking at just what pastels I had left out of my uh, set of pastels that I've ruined into paint. Um, and I was like, you know what, I think I can make a pretty nice sort of red-orange out of this. Probably will lean similar to what you might get out of a cat red uh, hue, uh, whether that be a light, a meter, more dark. I don't know yet because I've only done this a handful of times. Uh, now I also want to say that I have not made this video prior to today, uh, or rather this week, because I really had to test this stuff out. I've had these, <coughs> I've had my muller and the grinding plate for about a month now, but I really needed to test this out before I decided to make a video about it. So I made two batches, uh, actually maybe three batches of oil paint, uh, two batches of, of watercolor and a batch of acrylic in order to see what kind of worked out well uh, on a, both short term and long term, and I think what would show up well in a video. Uh, so today we're actually gonna be making a watercolor, mostly because it's the easiest to clean up. Uh, so this particular mixing plate, it's, uh, I don't know the dimensions, and I don't really care right now. Uh, one thing to note is that the whole surface, at least initially, is textured. Uh, especially on the outer edges, you're going to get a little bit of a tooth to it. The more you use it, the more it kind of smooths out as you grind it down. The same thing with the uh, surface of the muller itself. There's a little bit of a texture here initially, but between this and sort of the center area of the mixing plate, uh, that I've kind of smoothed out just by making a few batches of paint. And that just is going, something that's going to happen. Initial tools we're going to need here besides our pigments, uh, our mixing plate and muller, is uh, a palette knife or painting knife of sorts. I like using these more spatula type ones uh, just because they're going to be a little bit more effective in just moving the paint around. You want to make sure they're as clean as possible. I just realized I had to scrape some excess pigment off of that from a previous batch. Uh, and you're going to want... Uh, it depends actually a little bit on what you're gonna, kind of paint you're going to be making. Uh, if you're going to be making acrylic, I would recommend something like uh, like a regular gel mat, uh, a little bit of water, which I'm going to actually be using today for my watercolor batch in a spray bottle, uh, as well as something like a uh, GAC 100 in order to make the uh, the acrylic. If you're making oil, it's going to be just simply a linseed, alkyd, or walnut oil. And for a watercolor, you're going to need either gum arabic or the stuff I have in place of gum arabic, uh, Coors watercolor medium, which is just a regular, uh, their binding medium, Aquazol. So we're going to be using that. A uh, tiny bit of water, not a ton. Makes, makes it uh, impor ma important to note that <coughs> you're not adding a lot of water to your paint. Even if you're making a relatively thin paint, you do not want to add a lot of water to it. Uh, because it cause, causes issues and, and with the paint not really uh, adhering with the medium as well. You're going to get some separation issues uh, if you add too much water. So, that said, let's try and get started again. I said that already once tonight, but uh, hey, let's just try and work on this. Also, this is a kind of a complex, easy, easy and fun, but complex process. Also, I want to ma ma make note of something right out of the gate here. I'm going to mute the sound, not mute the sound, but at least pull it back a little bit. Uh, because what you're going to be getting a lot of out of uh, in this video is grinding and scraping noises. If you don't like those, that's why I kind of pulled pull those back partially. But you might just want to mute and try and find where I'm talking in between. Uh, but you're going to hear a lot of that throughout this video. And a lot of this scraping sound. So if that's not really your forte, uh, maybe just skip to the end to, to where I uh, finish. But you gotta really, I, I know for some people this is gonna be a nails on the chalkboard sound, but uh, it's satisfying to work on. I know probably not the most satisfying thing to hear. Uh, so I will do my best to pull that audio back in post-production, but uh, for the sake of grinding this down, it's just something that happens. That's just how it works. Um, making paint is noisy. Okay, so the first thing you want to do, uh, now that I've been talking and prepping uh, the whole process all this time, but again, I get it. Th th this, is a, this is not a, a beginner tutorial. This is something that, that you have to kind of do and do a few times. And like I said, I did this about five, six times before I got to this point. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is grind our pigment. And again, the last time I did this, I just 
ground stuff up in a mortar and pestle and do it that way. But the problem in doing that is you don't get a fine enough grind uh, in doing so. So because chalk pastels, at least most of them, are relatively soft, you can just use the weight of the muller itself. And this thing is like two pounds, so it's got a good weight to it. And you can just kind of twist it and push that down. Oh, lost the camera. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Did not think about uh, movement for the sake of the tripod. Uh, so yeah, just start kind of grinding it down. And you're going to be pushing a bunch. Uh, what you'll find out is that, and I also apologize, just realizing now the camera's going to shake. That's just going to be a thing. Is that... Uh, you're going to get a workout doing this. It's, it takes some effort. So one thing you're going to see me do a lot is make circles and figure eights. So circular motions and then figure eights in particular are actually the most effective. And as I work, I will scrape the muller off and then recenter my pile. Uh, and this this I will do multiple times throughout the course of both the, the grind uh, or the dry grind rather, uh, as well as the wet grind. Because you really want to make sure you're getting every little pigment particle you can and not leaving anything uh, outside of that mix. It tends to spread out. This is why the modern process of using a, of, of, uh, a dispersion mill is a lot nicer. <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to do this. Also, when you get, uh, when, uh, whether you're buying a, a little uh, jar of pigment or the manufacturers are doing it, and it comes out like a big bag, this, is already, this process is already done. You don't actually have to grind down the pigment uh, uh, another time, but Again, because we're using a chalk pastel as our starter. And it ends up being a little more of a process just to grind down that pigment. All right. So that's going to be my initial grind. And again, that's just a very simple, basic powder it up real fast kind of uh, step. Uh, and again, this is this process will have already been done for you if you're buying just a pigment uh, pre pre ground pigment, I guess you could say. Um, but the real grind uh, for us is going to happen uh, when we start mixing in our medium. Now, when I find what I find with watercolors, and what I like to do is again uh, grab the spray bottle, and we're actually just going to wet sort of the outer edges of this. So I just want to, I'm going to hold them pretty back, back pretty far with my spray bottle here too. I'm, I'm not here, I'm like way, way back. I just want to wet that outer surface uh, just a little bit, just to get it started. And then the section in the center, I create like a little bit of a well, if you've ever made uh, pasta or sometimes bread, uh, bread dough. You'll do a very similar thing with this, mostly pasta. Um, and then you want to add your medium slowly, not everything all at once, because you really don't know the consistency and how much you want to add right out of the gate. Uh, but I've been using, uh, just to start out, two droppers full of this stuff. Again, this is a Coors watercolor medium. And then again, we're going to kind of just push it together circles and then figure eights. And the first part of this is always going to be a little harder. It's going to take a little more working right out of the gate. And because we're making watercolors today, I might add a little extra spray to this. Yeah, that pigment's very, very, very coarse at this point. And this is where I was when I tried to do this by making acrylics, which did work. Again, mortar and pestle style. Uh, but I couldn't get that grind fine enough. And that's partly because as soon as you start adding medium, you start to see all of those heavier, thicker pigment particles. And then you don't uh, really get to 
grind them down any further because then it's wet at that point. Unless you want to totally ruin your mortar and pestle, you're not going to really be able to do that. Which is why the uh, the muller and the grinding plate is very important. I'm going to up this to another two droppers full. And I'm actually going to add a spray of water to the center. Maybe two. And just, again, grinding out. Now one thing, if you're new to the, to the grinding plate and uh, muller, is you never want it to have that perfectly uh, 90 degree, 90 degree on each other. Uh, because what you'll find, so I'll actually do this for a second. Um, <clears throat> what you'll find is that it'll stick. So you have to kind of twist and pull up to get it to come loose. Uh, especially if you're doing a bigger batch of, say, oil paint. Um, uh, I'm sure the table's really shaking up. I'm sorry for that. Um, but, yeah, really grinding that together. And then, again, slowly adding in. Slowly adding in the, the medium until it's the right consistency. It's still really thick right now. I'll grab some of the water I have on that outside edge. I would say, again, for watercolor or acrylic, you want to add a little water. Uh, for oil, you don't have to, uh, just because if you do, it causes weird separation issues because oil has a different chemical makeup to uh, an acrylic or, or a watercolor. Um, get a couple more of these. All right, that's six total, and that's probably pretty good. I actually don't know if I'm going to need any more. Um, it's just going to be a matter of grinding it down at this point. That's a really nice color, too. Six droppers full, and that was pretty much perfect. But what you'll find again is like as you're grinding too, that builds up on that outer edge. So you just have to keep working it down, bringing it back to the center. It's time consuming, but uh, it's actually really fun to do. And it's again, really satisfying being able to really just grind out your own paint. Again, pulling some of that water I had on the side. And the water thing too, like the first batch of watercolors I did, took me a while to realize that I actually did need to spray down some water in order to use that, utilize that properly. This is very... And again, if you put that uh, vertical too much after you grind down that pigment, it's going to lift the whole thing. you got to turn and pull. And I'll forget that as I go, but sometimes it's just good to get that grind when it's flatter against the stone. Oh, wow, yeah. Whole camera's moving now. This looked pretty good. Um, so I've got the right consistency now in terms of viscosity, in terms of where I want the paint to be uh, in that way. But I can still, uh, I'm looking at it as well as uh, as you grind it. And again, the more you, you grind pigment, the more you start to uh, get experience with it. And you kind of start to see how coarse or how fine that grind should be. Uh, so it's actually really important to uh, to practice. Uh, if you're going to start making paint in, in any capacity, whether that be with a uh, a dry pigment from something like uh, 
Uh, Gamblin, I know, does them. I think Williamsburg has some. Uh, it's really important to uh, practice uh, and, and understand that you're going to waste stuff, waste materials uh, as you go, uh, just because it takes some time to really figure out what you're going to do and, and, and how fine of a grind you need to make. So I'm just going to go ahead and probably toss some of this into time lapse because this actually does take a little bit of time. And again, uh, my, I'm keep stretching my hands, my fingers here, because again, as you do this, uh, you can cramp up really easily. So it's important to, to stop, take breaks, uh, stretch your hands as you go, uh, because uh, uh, again, it, it takes a little bit of force and a bit of pressure to actually do this. So I'm going to just go ahead and probably grind this for about another five minutes and should be fairly good for the, the level of uh, consistency, consistency that I want. And if I notice the paint starting to dry out a little bit too much, I'll grab a quick spray of water, but I think I should be good for a while. Okay, so at this point, I'm actually going to stop. Um, this is a fairly nice, thick uh, paint at this point. I do see it just spreading it around. I do see some uh, little flutters in here, which I would get, say, a little thicker pigment particles, which isn't that big of a deal for me personally. Uh, I, but I also know that if I wanted to, I could actually sit here and grind this for at least another 10 to 15 minutes if I wanted a, like just a ridiculously smooth paint. Uh, but this is part of the process of just figuring out uh, exactly how long you need to grind it in order to figure out what you want it to be and how uh, how much paint you really want to get out of it. Uh, for the most part, like again, you're going to push this together, you're going to get a little pile. Uh, you will lose some. Uh, all this stuff here, all this excess on the, the side, uh, granted I can sit here with a watercolor brush and thin it out and try and salvage it, but it's honestly just not really worth it. Uh, so what I'm going to do with this batch here is take this and put this on this palette here I've got to the side. This is just a little ceramic thing. This piece of green uh, watercolor that I made the other day. I'm just going to scoop this onto here since I don't have any uh, empty tubes or anything. And because it's watercolor, thankfully, we actually can let this dry. And um, uh, then rework it later, uh, which is kind of the whole concept of doing watercolor, which I think if you're going to start making paint, that's going to be the easiest thing for you guys to do. Uh, just because you can reactivate it and it's easier to clean up than anything else. So if you're looking for a good way to start, if you're going to start doing this, uh, whether pastels or with pigments or whatever else, um, try watercolor first uh, and then worry about making uh, oil or acrylic, especially not acrylic because given the dry time, you're going to be making a batch and probably not going to be saving it for more than a day. Okay, one of the most important things with any painting process, especially making paint, is the cleanup. So I'm just going to get some hot water going here. And because we're, again, because we made watercolors, this is going to be super easy. I just have to rinse stuff, rub stuff down. Uh, I can just use the, the warmth of the water to clean this off. Uh, if we were making oil paint, uh, I would have to be using not water in this case, but uh, turpentine, turpenoid, uh, or mineral spirits in order to clean this off which even sink, the sink process sucks. Just got to let you guys know now. Um, it usually involves two different passes, both one uh, for the paint muller as well as one or two for the grinding plate uh, mixed for a rather irritating uh, process to try and clean that up. Um, but again, for watercolors and somewhat for acrylics, uh, if you have somewhat dried acrylic when you're, after you've been making paint for a while, uh, just use some rubbing alcohol, it comes right off. But really, really important to not only clean your uh, paint and, and surface and all this stuff after, usually right after you work so you don't have to do as heavy of a process later, uh, but also you need to have the space to do this. Uh, so in advance, if you don't have like a laundry tub like this, if you're trying to do this in an apartment, in advance, don't don't do, try to do this in an apartment uh, sink. Although it would probably work in a bathtub. Now that I'm thinking about it, um, 
but always, always, always clean your surface off. Do not forget to do that. Okay, so now we're about ready to test out our uh, paint batches. Uh, so I've got uh, some water, watercolor brush, this is some bristle paper that I had lying around, so it'll be a little smoother than what you might get out of a standard 140 pound cold, cold press, but that's quite alright. Um, so the, now we get to see basically how we did. So I'm going I'm to try out both the, the dry greenish blue stuff I made about a week and a half ago as well as the stuff we just made. So the fresh stuff will be really similar to what we just would get out of a tube, a uh, tube of watercolor, usually a small uh, what, one ounce, two ounce, something like that. I've got tubes that are uh, 11 mils and 14 mils, so it's around that section. I think it's something like th like half to three quarters of an ounce, depending on the uh, depending on the tube. But uh, yeah, that after that grind, you know what we've got is a uh, fairly simple, decent watercolor. Out of all of that, I do see a little bit of uh, extra. What's well, extra pigment in that? I guess you could say, but um, yeah, there's, there's some grainy sections in here. You can see a couple little blips where uh, all of those uh, extra big pigment particles that I didn't, again, spend that extra 15 minutes grinding. But uh, for the most part, we've got a fairly simple and smooth watercolor that actually looks really nice. Uh, now, again, using the same watercolor medium, in, that, in this case, the uh, uh, Coors watercolor medium, uh, just some water. Uh, I made this stuff, oh geez, yeah, again, probably about a week and a half, almost two weeks ago, I think now. Um, and so I let this dry, so it is very similar to what you may get out of a pan or a cake watercolor. So it's going to take some extra water to really activate it. Uh, but just with a little bit of water, comes right back to life. And again, any pan or cake watercolor, you got to really kind of work it out to reactivate it. Actually, if I recall, I did a coarser grind for this green. So it's actually a little bit more difficult to pull that out, but again, watercolor, you just have to keep working it. And you've got fairly nice. This one actually leans, seems to lean a little more transparent uh, than the red does. Although the more I let this sit, the more it'll kind of tack up and be thicker and nicer. And you created watercolor out of chalk pastels, which I still cannot believe this worked. We're, we're four years apart on these on these videos. Uh, two different times I did this and well several different times if you count how many times I've used the grind, grinding plate, but yeah, you absolutely can make paint, whether that be oil, acrylic, or watercolor out of chalk pastels. So what started as a weird, strange, and unusual experiment that I started four years ago, well, three and a half, I think, technically, has now blossomed into something that not only works, but works really, really well, if you have the right tools. And I think that's sort of the base standard practice with any art, is sometimes you just need the right tools to get the job done for the thing you're trying to do. Uh, were, was I able to make uh, paint uh, neck back then acrylics by grinding uh, like horrible pink colored pastels with a mortar and pestle and mixing it with some uh, acrylic mediums? Yes, I was able to do that. But I wasn't really able to do it effectively or well enough to actually make it a practicable, utilizable paint. But now that I have the tools that I need, aka my paint muller and mixing plate, not only can I make acrylics, I can make watercolors, I can make oils. If somebody gave me another medium in between all of those, I could probably make some of that too. It just takes some time, and it takes some time to learn and to practice and figure out what you're doing. Um, so this is, again, really part two of this long four-year experiment of if you can make paint out of chalk pastels. And what I said the first time, which was, yeah, you can, but it's a little too gritty. What I can say this time is, yeah, you absolutely can, and it's not gritty anymore. It's a usable, viable paint, and I cannot wait to make a wider range of colors to use in my studio and in my paintings going forward. So I really love this concept because it's a great example of how you can start with just a really basic raw idea 
And as long as you work at it enough, it can actually blossom into a great idea. Uh, but not always. I mean, sometimes, it's a, even if you work at it enough, it's a terrible idea. But this one actually seemed to work out well. And if you saw part one, whether that be when it first launched or just in the middle of this video or after watching this video, uh, I hope you can see how much uh, time makes for uh, either developing a painting technique, uh, developing paint, or just developing as an artist. Uh, a lot of people don't seem to realize that developing uh, both an art technique as well as developing your own working process as an artist, that takes time. It takes time to build up your skill set. And this part two of this video really, I think, shows that, is that, yeah, I didn't start out knowing what I was doing. I was just playing around. But if you actually focus in, if you actually put in the time and the effort to, uh, to learn, this is what it can become. It can become a full-fledged technique, of, and you can actually learn how to make paint out of chalk pastels. So if you enjoyed this video or learned something, please hit the like button. It really helps the video out. Share with your friends and family that are interested in art, uh, because that's cool too. I love expanding uh, sort of the, the reach of my videos and seeing how far this stuff can go, because if I can inspire, inspire somebody else, that makes all the difference in the world. As always, for my art, you can find that stuff in the description box below in social links, my own website, and all that fun stuff. Uh, get subscribed if you're not already, and at this point, I hope you are after this video. Uh, and this has been Super Deluxe Studios. Keep on creating, and I'll see you guys next time. Also, as a general PSA, uh, if you're sick with corona or uh, are seeing this way later and it doesn't matter anymore, but stay healthy, stay safe. I cannot stress this enough. Um, these are really weird times. Uh, it's very strange to live in the life and the uh, society we're living in currently with quarantine and everything like that. So stay healthy, stay safe, wash your hands often, um, and uh, yeah, just, just take it easy.